Hello, good people. This is our sixth video, and it's called Ever Have a Mystical Slash Spiritual Experience? And not that I'm not excited for all of these videos, but I am really excited for this one, just saying. Okay? So the question is, my intention is for this video is to help normalize having mystical experiences, because I think many of us do every day, and we live in a culture where it seems to be hard to talk about that and to validate the fact that that's what's going on. So that's where we're going today, and let's have fun, okay? So my first question is, are you a person with mystical sensitivities? And for the beginning part of this video, that's going to be the question I'm going to ask you to come back to a few times just to see. So to start with, how would you answer that question? Are you a person with mystical sensitivities? Okay, great. Now, current Pew, P-E-W research, not P-U, but Pew research, check them out if you want to on Google, um, says that 50% of people living in the United States of America have mystical slash spiritual experiences. Isn't that shocking? Isn't that great? It's not what I expected these days but it's what the data is saying. Okay, I'm going to start by reading a little something. Sweet, sweet quote. quote. Spiritual, mystical moments are direct, are personal, and often have the effect, if only for a moment, of waking us up and expanding our understanding of who we are and our place in the universe. So we're going to start with that one. We'll get back to the book that that's been taken from a little bit later today, but I'm going to move on to another book to start with. As you know, with all these videos, I highlight one book and then bring in others. And today's book is called Beyond Religion. It's written by David Elkins. It is a brilliant book as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I want to highlight some of what he's saying. What I'm going to read a little bit is going to be about, he talks about a continuum or a spectrum of mystical, spiritual, sacred moments. And he thinks that most people, and I would agree with this, tend only to think that a mystical experience is the most intense category of mystical experiences. And he's broken them down into little intensity, medium intensity, and large intensity. And I'm going to be highlighting the words, talking about the words that he um, uses and then reading a little bit about each of the three categories. So, intensity levels of sacred experiences. The lower intensity, he calls poignant moments. Love the word poignant, this by itself. And what he says about that is, poignant moments are the most common sacred slash mystical slash spiritual experiences. These are the times when our soul is gently stirred, when the sacred rushes against us. They may occur when we listen to music, when we watch a sunset, when we play with a child, when we take a walk by the ocean. Poignant moments are not earth-shaking or life-changing, but they certainly touch our hearts and nourish our souls. Okay? I know this morning I was trying a new type of tea with um, with, with honey in it, and the honey had an herb in the honey as well. I don't know what it said, but it was such a sweet new taste of tea and honey together. But that was a poignant moment. I just stopped for a second, smelt it, tasted it, and for a moment, three seconds, two seconds, just had a poignant moment. I went for a walk today and saw a couple of sweet red birds chirping to each other, and I just stopped and listened. Couldn't see them, but just heard the sounds. That was a poignant moment. I just want to highlight that poignant moments for each of us, I think, happens numerous times every day. But the concept of having a poignant moment, which is lower end mystical moment or spiritual moment, I don't think most people understand that or honor that to the extent that it is. So that would be his lower category of mystical, spiritual, sacred moments. The medium one he calls peak experiences. As I use the term, peak experiences are more intense than poignant moments. Abraham Maslow, who we've spoken about previously, calls all mystical moments peak experiences. That's his thinking. Um, David Elkins, 
uses peak experiences for the middle of the intensity level. So I love the way he does that, and I'm going to read what he says. Compared to poignant moments, peak experiences tend to last longer, touch us more deeply, and produce more lasting changes in our lives. Yet these experiences lack the overwhelming power of a full-blown mystical encounter. And then he gives an experience of a student of his having a peak experience. So I'll read that to see how truly that rings with your experiences so far. A graduate student told me the following peak experience. She had gone for a walk on the beach in the late afternoon. As the sun was sitting, she climbed onto a boulder at the water's edge. Gazing out to sea, she felt herself slowly becoming one with nature. With the sun descending toward the horizon, the waves crashing at her feet, the pastel colors that streaked the western sky. She said, in that moment, I felt eternity. I knew these things had gone on for millions of years before I came, and that they would go on for millions of years after I'm gone. It felt good to be alive, to be part of all this. I was deeply moved and began to cry. This experience had a profound effect on the young woman. It stayed with her for a few days afterwards and prompted her to make some important decisions in her life. So just take a moment now. And first of all, think about, did you have any poignant moments today so far or in the past day? And then, have you been gifted with a peak experience so far today or in the past couple of days? Again, I think we all have poignant moments every day. I think peak experiences we probably have numerous times every year, if not numerous times every month. But I'm not certain for most of us it's numerous times or a time every morning. Okay? The most intense type of mystical experiences are called mystical encounters. I'm going to read what you know, Beyond Religion says about that. They are sometimes so powerful that they produce temporary psychological disorganization. Mystical encounters are often border events, events that mark a transition from one way of life to another. Prophets and seers have been called to their missions by such events. Among indigenous people, these experiences often manifest as a state of being possessed, and in traditional religion, they sometimes occur as overwhelming conversions or calls to a new way of life. The religious literature of Western culture is filled with accounts of mystical experiences. Okay, so we're going to start with the fact that we've all had poignant moments, we may have had some peak experiences, and there exists a further range of mystical encounters that we may or may not have, but nonetheless, if we have poignant moments, we've had mystical, spiritual experiences. And I'm trying to normalize the fact that at least 50%, if not 100% of the people in this country have these moments. We just don't know what to call them and what to do with them. Okay? Next piece. Let's look at data for a little bit and see what research has said about it. I'm going to go back to the 1970s briefly, the 1990s, and then current. So you get a sense that this has at least 50 years, if not 5,000 years, of research behind it. I'm going to start with psychosynthesis, which comes from um, Roberto Assagelli's work and the people that worked and studied with him. It came out in the 1970s and it talks about recently social scientists McCready and Greeley conducted a research study on mystical experiences in which they interviewed 1,400 persons chosen as a random sample of the population in the United States. To a key question, have you ever felt, though you were close to a powerful spiritual force that seemed to lift you out of yourself, as many as 35% replied yes, and half of those replied, replied several times or often. So that's going back 50 years. 
Next, I'm going to go into The Secret Spiritual World of Children. This quote I read to you all earlier about what that is. And here's what Tobit Hart, who's a wonderful psychologist, says about that one. Wrong page. I'll get to the right page, not to worry. It's page six. It appears that significant spiritual experiences are surprisingly common in the general population. Various polls have reported that between 20 and more than 60% of adults surveyed have had significant religious or spiritual or mystical experiences. But what about children? How exciting that is, right? Among, to address the question more directly, a colleague and I, I meaning Tobin Hart, the author, conducted a sophisticated statistical survey of 450 young adults. The results suggest that childhood experiences are very common. We asked about moments of wonder and awe, unitive experiences, and receiving spiritual guidance from a non-physical source, to name a few. The affirmative responses to various questions in this anonymous survey range from 10% to more than 80%. Of those, more than 60% said their first experiences started in childhood. So what a wealth of places to research about mystical spiritual experiences in childhood. And what we do as a civilization where that's so untalked about and almost afraid to be mentioned that a large majority of children, probably way more than 50%, don't include that as part of their inner nature as part of their reality, and it gets lost. Okay, and the research that can happen there, I think, is large still. And finally, current Pew, PEW research from the 1920s, say that one out of two people living in the United States of America have had a mystical spiritual experience. So it's been going on forever. Okay, so that's that one. Next, with me a little book. The next question is going to be, okay, how would one develop one's mystical consciousness and become a person with greater mystical sensitivities? So we're going to look first of all at those two questions. And I'm going to start with three books to let you know how, how, how prevalent it is. I probably could have chosen 50 books and I possibly could have chosen 5,000 books, but I'm limiting it to three. I'm going back to The Secret Spiritual World of Children by Tobin Hart, because I love what he says, and I love the fact that he's focusing on children. Here's where he starts. There are two general ways the mind operates. One is a kind of self-contained chatter in which we mentally process events, recycle the past, and anticipate the future. The other is a present moment awareness in which we feel the flow. When children and adults find a way to be quiet in their own special way, there is a subtle shift away from the chattering mind towards the larger stream of consciousness. In addition to being still, the chatter also quiets when we break the mind's routine by things such as witnessing great beauty, encumbering the unexpected, being in nature, taking a vacation, or just playing. Okay, so looking at, we're either in a still, quiet flow, or the mind chatter is overwhelming. Then I'm going to jump into a book called No Boundary by Ken Wilber. Ken Wilber is probably the leading theoretician these days when it comes to studying these phenomena, and um, the, the course we teach at Leslie is called Transpersonal Psychology, where all these books have been, are being used this semester. Okay, so let's look at what Ken Wilber says. He writes very academically, so get ready for a very academic but brilliant portrayal of this. 
most of us would have to admit that we have known moments, peak moments, which seemed indeed to lie so far beyond time that the past and future melted away into obscurity, lost in a sunset, transfixed by the play of moonlight on a crystal dock pond which possesses no bottom, floated out of self and time in an enraptured embrace of a loved one, caught and held still bound by the crack of thunder echoing through the mists of rain, who has not touched the timeless? We all have. That time appears suspended in all of these experiences because we are totally absorbed in the present moment is what Ken Wilber suggests we need to learn how to do more often. I want us to do one other thing from Ken Wilber. In this life in time, according to the mystic, is a life of misery. For the mystic claims that all of our problems are problems of time and problems in time. You might never have looked at it this way, but a moment's consideration reveals the utter obviousness of it. All of our problems concern time. Our worries are always worries over the past or over the future. We lament of our past actions and dread their future consequences. Our feelings of guilt are inseparably linked to the past and bring with them torments of depression, bitterness, and regrets. If this is not clear, then just imagine what it would be like to live without any of the scars of your past life. Again, I'm going to say that again. Just imagine what it would be like to live with any of the scars of your past life. That can only happen in the present moment. Okay. And finally, Practicing the Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle, probably 20 or 25 years ago, was ready to commit suicide. He was living such an awful existence. And he had a thought. And the thought was, I can't live with myself any longer. And because in that thought, he realized there was an I that was separate from and being able to distance itself from, I can't live with myself any longer, was able to distance himself from the self he couldn't live with any longer. He had a moment and his mind flipped. And it wasn't an ex a psychotic flip, it was an enlightening flip. And he's been become a, a, a spiritual teacher since then, although it took him years to get to that place, because at first he didn't understand what he was living and where he was and what had happened to him. So I'm going to read a little bit from his book as well. First part is, the beginning of freedom is the realization that you are not the thinker. The moment you start watching the thinker, a higher level of consciousness becomes activated. Then you begin to realize that there is a vast realm of intelligence beyond thought. That thought is only a tiny aspect of that intelligence. You also realize that all things that truly matter, beauty, love, creativity, joy, inner peace, arise from beyond the mind, and you begin to awaken. So this is from a man who has had that shift that many of us dream about. Then he talks about there's two ways to practice this, how to get there. And I'm going to go over both of those because I think they are amazing. One of my favorite words. So how do you free yourself from your mind? There are two ways. First way, you start listening to the voice in your head. I'm going to read what he says about that, even though I can talk about it. I want this man's words to be what you're left with. Start listening to the voice in your head as often as you can. Pay particular attention to any repetitive thought pattern. Those old audio tapes that have been playing in your head perhaps for many years. This is what I mean by watching the thinker which is another way of saying, listen to the voice in your head. 
be there as the witnessing presence. When you listen to that voice, listen to it impartially. That is to say, do not judge. Do not judge or condemn what you hear. For doing so would mean that the same voice has come in again through the back door. You'll soon realize there is a voice, and here I am listening to it, watching it, separate from it. This I am realization, this sense of your own presence, is not a thought. It arises from beyond the mind. So when you listen to a thought, you are aware not only of the thought, but also of yourself as the witness of the thought. And a new dimension of consciousness comes in. So that would be the first way to go about widening your contact with, with, with the mystical. The second step would be, instead of watching the thinker, you can simply create a gap in the mind Stream simply by directing the focus of your attention into the now. Just become intensely conscious of the present moment. This is a deeply satisfying thing to do. In this way you draw consciousness away from the mind activity and create a gap of no mind in which you are highly alert and aware but not thinking. This is the essence of meditation. So. You can become the witness and see yourself witnessing everything that's going on in your mind, in your consciousness. Or you can try and stay in the present moment now and realize that that is different from the past and the future and you don't need your mind for that moment. I'm going to read one other thing and then come back to you again. The present moment holds the key to liberation. But you cannot find the present moment as long as you are your mind. Enlightenment means enlightenment means rising above thought. In the enlightened state, you will still use your thinking mind as often as you need it, but in a much more focused and effective way than before. You will use it for practical purposes, but you are free of the involuntary internal dialogue that keeps on going and going and going. Eckhart Tolle talks about, we've got three choices. We can live in clock time. I'll meet you at two o'clock. Let's have dinner at 6. You've been 10 minutes late. Where have you been? Stuff like that, using a clock to determine where we're living. We can live in psychological time. And psychological time is I'm living in the past or the future. And the mind loves to live in the past and the future all the time. And again, that's where all of our issues come into. Or we can live in the present moment, this moment. If I'm thinking, if I'm using my mind to think, I'm in the past or the future. So I need to find a way to witness my mind so I can have my thinking be a tool because I know that I'm witnessing everything that's happening and while I'm witnessing, I'm also in the present moment. So those are the two tools to begin to um, work on having more mystical moments that are peak experiences and mystical encounters. Almost done, almost done now. Okay, finally. This semester I'm teaching a course at Leslie University called Transpersonal Psychology. Um, Transpersonal Psychology, precepts the necessity of ordinary states of consciousness for mapping out the terrain of the physical universe. But non-ordinary states are seen as powerful means of extending our knowledge beyond the four dimensions of the Newtonian, Einsteinian universe. Some of these non-ordinary states of consciousness to be explored include dreaming, meditative states, clear listening, intuitive wisdom, and mindfulness, to name just a few. But I want to read two quotes from the syllabus of that course. The first one's by Uncle Albert, or Einstein, as we call him. The most beautiful and profound emotion we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. It is the sour the source of all true science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. Albert Einstein saying that about consciousness and what happens if we don't live there intimately. And finally, a quote by McLaughlin, who wrote a book called um, On Feeling Good, which is, technologically so deep 
that the title makes me laugh that he calls it Unfeeling Good. Okay, but it is part of what he's going to. And this is the last quote. We must learn the rules of the divine game before we can consciously begin to play a role in the divine game. The world of, mystic, of, 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 of spiritual mystical experiences is a game that many of us are not aware of how to play, not aware of how to use that in our lives for greater happiness and, connected, and connectedness. Um, and courses like transpersonal psychology and many other experiences help people understand how to play that game. And I think most of us don't learn that that exists, that they're normative experiences, and how then to use those experiences functionally for health and wellness and to have a life that makes it much more meaningful and joyful. And finally, I brought a prop. It's called a snow cone. I learned that yesterday. This is how we normally, many of the students knew that I didn't. This is a person living in the middle of all the voice chatter. Look at all the stuff there. Hard to see that person. Hard to see that person, see what's happening around that person. But as the mind chatter becomes less, we can see the person more clearly, and the person can see outside more clearly. You ready to learn the rules of the game? Quiet the mind a little bit and see what opens up. Hope you enjoyed it. I did. See you all next time. Enjoy the rest of your day, please.